I've joined a couple of times. I've uh, I've joined this meeting a couple of times where uh, proper uh, scientists are presenting, and um, it's, it's been quite exciting to learn uh, from everyone here. Uh, I feel privileged to write uh, this nature enthusiast as my uh, description of who I am because I, I really, really love uh, being out in nature. Um, today, we're going to be discussing a topic which uh, I call the legacies of um, a bird clubs. Uh, the title initially was legacies of a bird club, but this is a, uh, I mean, it's a national, goal, I dare say, a global thing. So we won't limit it to our bird club only in just, but what we're going to be discussing applies to most of the bird clubs around. And um, it is really, really basic information. It's not a, it's not a high level um, um, a discussion. So I plead with experts in the audience to, to bear with me. Uh, it's going to be a really, really basic uh, 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 discussion today. And um, along the way, while we're discussing, I would like if you have any ideas that pop into your head, just drop it in the comment, comment section. And uh, uh, towards the end, we will just look through um, those ideas that uh, uh, will come up. Here I have a picture of this old woman. And um, it's interesting to know that sometime many, many years ago, this woman would have been a very little child that would have been given birth to by some mother somewhere in a home somewhere. And um, uh, fast forward many years afterwards, we see her looking old, tired, and, and haggard. And uh, this is a story of many, many uh, 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 people, many, many situations that we find our, ourselves. And I just want to uh, quickly just uh, go to the historical background of um, uh, bird club. While I was doing a little search, this particular um, uh, bird club kept coming up in almost every search that I did. Um, did not all ornithologic, uh, ornithological club. It was an, a very old bird club that started in 1883 in the United States. It's said to have been founded by um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, by a group of amateur ornithologists led by William Brewster which is a prominent figure, figure in American um, uh, ornithology. They said initially their focus was just on studying birds and conducting field trips, collecting spacemen. But ultimately, as they grew, um, they re suddenly realized the need for them to be able to um, uh, contribute to knowledge. And then they came up with this um, uh, uh, journal which is called the AUC, AUK. I'm sure that uh, members of the audience who are experts would be familiar with it because apparently I saw that it's quite a, a big thing in the ornithology uh, field. And since 1884, they've been making significant contribution. And you know, the, the exciting thing for me is about the duration of time. Then, and then I, I really did another search to see whether these guys have, are still alive and active and working. And interestingly, they are. They are still really, really uh, very active. So they said they play a crucial role in conservation movement, advocating for broad bird protection of habitats, contributing to knowledge, you know. And they say today, this club um, uh, does research mainly in education, conservation, and, uh, and the likes of things. So originally, historically, like I said, Birds Club started initially like, uh, you know, just formal groups throughout history, people with like interest in um, uh, bird watching, uh, share their observations and knowledge about birds. Uh, so this is the form of uh, the sort of the uh, primordial stage of bird club development. Over the years, in the, between the 18th and the 19th century, se uh, several naturalist societies often included bird watching among their interests. While not dedicated solely to just watching birds, they could be considered as the precursors. So in a way, by way of looking at how the bird club starts, so it's basically started as a group of naturalists who were interested in you know, uh, nature um, and uh, they had this interest. And over time, it metamorphosed into what we call bird clubs today, bird organizations, and uh, even the, the, the practice itself of um, uh, ornithologists. And some of the things that actually triggered these bird clubs from um, uh, uh, picking up its, this uh, practice that was uh, 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 called plume hunting. So basically what happened in the past, in the 18th, 19th century was that the uh, high in society um, he used the feathers of beautiful birds to make their clothes. In, uh, so sometimes the 
the hat that the women wore had a lot of this beautiful um, feather from the skin of, uh, I mean, from the, from the birds. And because of that, it became a valuable trait and these birds were being killed in their numbers. It said that this particular egret was almost getting extinct in the US in the 18th century because of the degree to which it was being hunted. I read a certain paper that described the, the trade as um, equivalent to gold mining, actually, you know, and you know that gold mining is a very um, lucrative business. So for, for plume uh, business to be considered equivalent to gold mining, it must have been a very lucrative business. And um, that's one of the one of the sort of things that triggered in nature enthusiasts to form clubs that would for, uh, do some form of advocacy against such practices. So mainly, like I said, the early contenders, like I said, this bird club keeps coming up. But besides this one, there's the Scottish Ornithology Club and then the, 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 the Society for the Protection of Birds, which um, also started in 1889 um, in the United uh, Kingdom. Although they are primarily focused on bird conservation, it's also had some social and educational elements. Interestingly, RS. RSPB is still in the United States. They still have very active website in the United Kingdom. I mean, a very active website. I've joined them to do some bird watching in um, uh, England, in where uh, some part of England where I stayed before. And um, so these were some of the early contenders. Um, in the 20th century, bird watching progressively got um, uh, better, isn't it? Yeah, bird watching suddenly became a hobby with growing legs. And the binoculars, I mean, the invention of the binoculars, which I'll mention a little about, was also one of the, in um, uh, biochemistry, we call it a rate limiting step, step isn't it? Uh, the development of the binoculars make, became more accessible, making bird watching to become a, a popular and uh, 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 hobby. You know, and then education and outreach. Many clubs expanded their focus beyond just being enthusiasts, just being nature lovers. They offered guided works, lectures, educational programs, and fostering a wilder appreci appreciation of nature. And so what I'm trying to do is to take us through this history and to see the sort of activities that people have been doing from prehistoric time, historic time to current uh, this uh, day and age and see how do we key into this sort of things. What kind of legacy are we going to be? Because these people have left huge gaps. You know, look at this club that was formed in 1886, you know, uh, still doing um, uh, great things, right? So studies suggest that bird watching and uh, bird watching participation is growing um, at a very alarming rate. And uh, there are certain factors that are making bird watching to be popular. It's access, it's accessibility. Basically, on Fridays after I finish, I close from work at uh, 4 p.m. I just uh, carry my bag to the back of the hospital and blah, I'm ready to start bird watching. So it's accessible. And then also um, a wide range of patients, uh, of people, ah, I said patients, <laughs> a wide range of people uh, can participate also. So it's, a, it's, it's a really a hobby for everyone. You can have the, the elderly. Um, in my last presentation, I talked about how bird watching is being used at uh, nursing homes to help um, people with dementia to remember things and to have um, wonderful time. So the demographics, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a wide range, retirees, nature enthusiasts, families, on Sunday, myself and Dr. Nandom were out at the Lamingo Dam with our families bird watching, you know, so it, it's, it's this thing. And it also has its economic impact. I've mentioned in this forum that I have paid um, $100 in Zimbabwe to go bird watching. So it also has its economic uh, um, importance. And it's one of the things I want us to talk about as bird clubs in Nigeria. How can we make, um, how can we develop the economic component of bird, of this bird watching club so that people become motivated? Uh, the communities, we're talking with uh, uh, someone over the weekend about the community around Aplori that people are beginning to build. That's, yes, that's Dr. Talatu. People were beginning to build houses around Aplori and then they were dumping refuse in the reserve and things like that. Um, and so I'm thinking in my head that, you know, if um, we have like 10, 15 boys in a, the community around Amurum who become uh, uh, bird watching guides to people who come to do bird watching, paid bird watching um, um, uh, safaris at, in Amurum, those are people that are going to be advocates for, um, uh, for, for the forest itself, the reserve itself, because they're making some revenue from, you know, um, uh, the, the reserve. So I talked about binoculars. Um, this was one of the rate 
defining thing that happened in um, um, in the field of bird watching as a hobby or birding as it's called. The fact that the binoculars was uh, developed, it became something uh, portable um, and it could increase the magnification. You could see things from a distance. And this is as far back as the 18th um, uh, 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 century. So it's a, um, it was a really, really big thing. I looked at the NIBAB website and found it interestingly that there are quite a number of um, the bird cloths that are springing all around the country, which is really, really exciting because, um, I mean, as it is now, even though we've had the Ornithology Institute in JAWS, there are still a lot of people who don't know anything about bird watching. In fact, they find it strange. Really, I, I, I tell this story that uh, one day I posted a picture on, um, on, on Facebook of a bird. And uh, someone called my friend to say, Kai, this uh, uh, Dr. Pantong, is he okay at all? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are wondering, what, what the hell are you doing with birds, posting pictures of birds every day? So um, my friend called me to tell me that ah, people are beginning to question your sanity <laughs> because of that. So there's still a lot of lack of knowledge about, um, uh, about this thing. I'm not going to talk about bird club without talking our own uh, dear, dear beloved uh, just bird club. So it is something that is really, really, really growing. So the big question, I guess, that I would like us to really, really focus on is what impact do bird clubs make, right? What impacts have they made and what impact do they make and how can we make similar impact as a bird club, whether it's just bird club, Lagos bird club. I, I even saw Shandam bird club. I was excited. I was like, oh, okay. That means we can have a, a, a Lamingo Bird Club and, and stuff like um, like that. But that's the crux of the discussion. It's gonna be a brief presentation. I have uh, basically 24, 25 slides to go through. And um, I, like I said, for those who are joining now, you can actually, if during the pre presentation, if you have ideas on things that bird clubs, doesn't have to be just bird club, any bird club within our uh, area, if you have, have ideas of things that we can do that will leave um, a lasting legacy. I would like you to drop it in the comment section so we can briefly brainstorm and talk about it and see how um, uh, we can implement it. But um, one of the key things that bird clubs do is advocacy, right? In the late 19th and 20th centuries, bird clubs like the Al Audubon Society and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds were instrumental in raising awareness about the plight of declining population of birds due to the trade that I talked about, um, uh, plume harvesting, isn't it? Yeah, but it's a group of people that went to and did a lot of advocacy. So uh, one of the questions I'm going to pose here is how much advocacy are we um, are we carrying out, you know, about the, what is happening to the population of the, um, uh, 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 of the birds in our environment? We were bird watching with uh, uh, Joseph the other time, and I was telling him that I feel that um, as a club, we're not doing so much in terms of educating the community, doing advocacy. Um, the people who make the laws, they have no idea that there's anything called bird watching as, uh, you know, um, um, as, a, as a hobby. Or if there are people who know that, very, very few. Basically, people just say, oh, um, what I know about birds is that you can shoot them with catapult and it's all something um, uh, funny like that. Interestingly, um, a couple of years ago, I think it's two years ago, we went all the way to um, Wase. Um, you would uh, be able to identify this um, lovely uh, view of uh, Wase, which, by the way, Wase Rock, which is an, uh, an insel back, is one of the few insel backs in the world that towers above uh, 350 feet above sea level. And um, I took this picture, and someone observe that this looks like a bird that is looking with its head up in the sky. Uh, but the reason why I posted this picture is because of this white pelican um, uh, uh, that I have here on the right of the screen. He said that the top of this mountain is one of the three, no, one of the five sites in Africa where, um, where which used to serve as a breeding site for these birds. And the guy I went to was a rock together, I went together with together, <laughs> To us, a rock. It says, as a child, he remembers seeing all these birds uh, flying to the uh, river to uh, take water and coming back to the summit of um, the rock. But I don't know, maybe uh, members of the bird club, when you're doing atlas, in, uh, you, you've seen these birds in, in, in Wasi. But this, the local says, in the past 10 years, 15 years, some have reported, they haven't seen any of these birds come around. 
So although they would say they haven't seen these birds coming around, but as um, nature enthusiasts and you who are biologists and experts, you, you, you pretty much know what that means, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a serious statement, isn't it? It's either uh, because they've been hunted down or um, they've become, they've, they're getting extinct or generally the place is becoming hostile. Uh, to them. So right in our backyard here in just something is happening that as a bird club, um, we, we can act as advocates and make sure that such a thing doesn't um, uh, continue. Similarly, um, species protection, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, apart from being advocated, advocacy efforts that led to establishment of important conservation measures, including the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. You know, so this act has helped to protect numerous bird species. And I thought to myself, um, what can we do? What can we do as, 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 uh, as bird clubs in Nigeria to um, um, uh, ensure that there are acts that protect our birds? For here in just we have birds that are endemic to us. Um, do our lawmakers know that we have such treasures? Are the areas where these birds are protected, are they? Uh, just behind the teaching hospital here where we've gone birding before, um, it, I mean, it's a very uh, rich place with a lot of bird species, but I, I see a lot of rock fire finches there all the time. But each week I go there to bird watch, I notice that the forest is being depleted. There's a lot, of, I mean, with the Tinubu government in place. Um, and if you care to observe, you will notice that a lot of trees have been uh, uh, felled. Even shrubs are being cut off completely for fire, um, uh, just for firewood um, to use as fuel, rather. Um, and I, I, I found this quite um, in, um, exciting when I read about the Birdman of Ibadan. So I understand that this guy is in charge of the bird club there in Ibadan. But it's a very exciting story about what they're doing in Ibadan. So it's not just um, to castigate us or to motivate us only as bird club members to leave legacies, but that we are, there are story, um, lovely stories of people doing great things about these species protections and we should do more. We should, as part of our activities as bird club, engage lawmakers. Basically, nothing stops us as one of um, one of the days to go to the House of Assembly to um, um, to do an advocacy on on bird protection. I was telling um, someone a story about uh, my bird photography that I used to think that uh, I was wondering how do these people get really really beautiful shots of these um, of birds, but I, then I went to East Africa. And the birds were standing right in front of me, of course. And I had a long zoom lens and uh, I would go very close to them and take a picture. And when I went back to the hotel, the people were looking crisp and beautiful. So I was like, oh, OK, I actually do know how to take pictures. It's just because the birds in Joss are always flying and they are running away. That's why the pictures are not good all the time. It's, so yeah i mean there's um, a lot of opportunity for us to um, you know um, um, cre create advocacy on um, about uh, bird protection so i think that's one of the things that we can do um, to leave a legacy about species protection is that we should be more deliberate about engaging lawmakers laws should be made right here in the sherry hills where we go to bird watch there's a lot of destruction of the natural habitat there uh, you know apart from amurum i don't know if there's any place that is not being um, um, uh, uh, distorted. The natural environment is not being um, distorted. Okay, so we move on to citizen science and bird monitoring. So this is one of the things that bird clubs do. And also I found this quite interesting that this bird counting that we do, you know, Christmas bird counting started as far back as 1900. So this is an interesting legacy. This is a sort of thing I, I hope and wish that this presentation would stimulate. What sort of ideas can we come up with? I know that there are quite a number of groups here. I know that there's the Better Earth Foundation or there about the Better Wednesday, uh, the cookie factory that does this Wednesday thing. It's a novel thing. It's a really, really beautiful thing to do, you know, that every Wednesday you say something about, but it takes time, but one day it will be recognized. It will be a big Facebook page that everybody is going to be talking about. Who knows? Uh, maybe by the time uh, cookie factory uh, is as old as the grandmother that I showed at the beginning, uh, that Facebook page is going to be hitting a million or two million uh, visitors who are going there to get information about conservation. But it's exciting to know that bird counting started back as started as far back as the 1900s, and this has become a global event and it is continuing to happen. Uh, so here I pose to ask, what can we do as bird clubs in Nigeria to create a sort of um, um, a historical event that will keep happening? A friend contacted me a couple of uh, weeks ago. He says, why don't we do um, um, like a, an exhibition, you know, or, or a competition rather, 
for wildlife photographers in Nigeria, bird photographers, and see how many people are going to submit the, uh, pictures and uh, um, um, uh, and then we we do a vote and see who wins. A sort of those kind of uh, you know ideas um, are, are, are good ideas to explore so that we leave legacies in the sands of um, uh, time. Another thing is this issue of long-term data sets, right? So if you're using uh, eBird as your um, the app used to collect data, you realize that um, um, I've, I've used eBird in different continents um, of the world and different countries. And um, when I'm in Nigeria, uh, the, the, the app, app has a feature where if you hear a call of a bird, if you click on it, and uh, it's going to help you to identify the bird just by listening to the call if you, if you don't really know the bird. But if you do it in Nigeria or in JOS, I'd say not Nigeria, because I haven't been to all the birding sites in Nigeria. If you uh, use that in JOS, it tells you that it doesn't have enough data to uh, identify the bird, right? I know that uh, we have our ABC app, we have our bird laser. I don't know the capacity of those apps, if they have those features um, in, in, ingrained in them. But I think that, uh, yeah, as we, uh, as a bird club, we should um, teach each other. I remember I wasn't really keen in logging my, um, the, the birds I see every day until one of those bird watching days when Dr. Talatu came along and she sort of talked about the importance of um, logging in the data into a data set. And uh, I thought, oh, that was a really um, um, nice thing. I'm, and right now I'm really, really excited about logging because I keep seeing my numbers going up and that keeps driving me to want to see uh, a new, new species. But what this would do to us, would do for us rather as, as a bird club or as bird clubs around Nigeria is that it will help us to increase um, the data that uh, uh, citizen scientists and uh, 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 biologists are collecting our, um, in the country. And they were able to make inferential um, um, deductions from these this data sets. And these are things that we can leave as a legacy. For instance, um, um, I know that uh, recently I saw that Amurum has, is one of the uh, richest sources of data uh, about birds in the country, you know? So that's something that is exciting. So I'm looking forward to hearing that um, one day it's going to be said that the Gombe uh, Bird Club has the richest data source for any of all the birds that can be seen in the Northeast, you know? Those kind of uh, things. 50 years from now, what will be known? What will be the, you know, the thing that people would hear about just bird club? What is the thing that people are going to be hearing about Lagos bird club? What is the key thing that will be striking about Abuja bird club 50 years from now when um, uh, we've all developed gray hair and uh, we're using sticks, uh, walking sticks to go bird watching? What legacy would we have left for the next generation uh, uh, coming? Education and public engagement. So this is also another area where I think uh, uh, for us in JOS, we are not doing much. I don't know about the other bird clubs, but yes, we, I mean, like I said the presentation is going to be short so we can hear uh, stories from other places, um, you know, but yeah, field trips, you know, on, on Saturday, we went for a field trip together with the MSC students and the uh, interns from Aplori. And that was quite exciting to send. We meet a lot of people and um, it's also quite um, educative. But I, I also know that uh, Waldi and his group have been doing some school, uh, move, uh, moving around schools to do workshops and educational programs. But I think that as a club also, um, uh, this should be one of the things that it's part of the activities that we fit into our schedule for the year. Um, that we have field trips, we have uh, the birding programs, we create workshops that we go to uh, places and educate people. I was excited when um, Ini told me that uh, there's going to be a competition tomorrow and that they have been invited to talk about conservation and, and stuff like that. So you infiltrate all the spheres and talk about what your passion is. Um, you, if you sit with people who love watching football, it doesn't take uh, uh, um, uh, 10, 15 minutes before they start telling you about which club they are supporting. You know, they start telling you about um, uh, what transfers have taken place in which in the Premier League and uh, who he's speculating would. Yeah, but it, it wasn't always like this. This wasn't always the conversation in the street in, in Nigeria. But over time, people who are enthusiasts for football, uh, they flooded all over the place which uh, so that if you don't watch football you feel left out you know so i'm looking at the future where everybody's going to be talking about bird watching you know 
as much as they're talking about football, you know, we can create that consciousness. We can, by, I mean, it's just um, hype, basically. You know, it's it's pressure. It's having a, a vision, having a goal, and keep pushing uh, towards achieving that goal. Is it possible for us to achieve that? Yes, it's very, very possible. The footballers have done it. They have, yes, they have. Um, uh, the gay rights people are also doing it. You know, so, I mean, the, the vegetarians are also doing it. Basically, I mean, when we're kids, who knows what vegetarianism is? <laughs> it was an alien kind of thing. But right now, you go on YouTube and you 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 see so many videos of people talking about um, uh, vegetarianism. Nothing stops us from having a YouTube channel where we are going to uh, display the birds of, um, uh, of Nigeria there. And we have uh, pictures, the calls, the uh, videos of these birds and let's just float the internet with information about our species right so one other thing that they uh, birds club do is that they have nature centers and publications right so i know that a lot of people are writing um, uh, publications about different things that are happening it's very encouraging um, but mostly it comes from the science part right nothing stops bird clubs from um, um, uh, writing yeah so Things as little as um, how many people go bird watching in Plateau State every month. That sort of data is absent. It's really, you know, absent. While I was preparing for this um, um, presentation, I came across an article online that talks about um, monetizing your hobby, right? So if you're a bird watcher, they were giving advice on how you can transform bird watching into a career and a source of um, income. And they said, in the US, the Department of Labor doesn't really have data about um, uh, how much bird watchers or tour guides who do bird watching earn, um, but they know how much biologists earn. So I asked myself, that's, that's a very important information, isn't it? If you come to Nigeria, are you able to get this sort of information? One day you may want to make a scientific presentation. When you're doing a scientific presentation, like I said, my <laughs> disclaimer at the beginning that this is not a very scientific presentation, right? You can't just make statements. Every statement you make, you have to back it by um, uh, uh, data and um, some authority. So things as little as how many people have been, how, how many years have we been bird watching as just bird club? What's the average number of attendance? It's something publishable that can serve as good data. Over the years, we'll be able to see how it has grown. Uh, who knows, by the time Nanchin is uh, 98 years old uh, and uh, uh, using very huge glasses, uh, somebody's going to come and do a documentary about how just bird clubs um, um, uh, started. Today, we're looking at um, uh, the Notal Bird Club. I mean, these were human beings like us who started this in the 18th, um, 17th century, as far back as the 17th century. Today, we're making reference to it. Who will be referencing our own contribution? Okay. Like I jumped one slide. Yeah, so uh, at the risk of overflocking the issue of um, the research, yeah, Aplori is doing a great thing. I know that I've heard recently that there is the IIT or something like that. And then uh, Dr. Talas also mentioned somewhere in um, an Aplori outpost in Benin City. I forgot the name. But yeah, so um, a lot of research. And um, yeah, interestingly, I read about this guy. He's not a biologist or, you know, a specialist. He's just a, a random guy like... Um, uh, myself and um, um, uh, Paul and, you know, all the uh, citizen scientists that are part of the Bird Club. But because of enthusiasm, you know, they, he has, has written quite a number of, of, of books and I, I found his story quite uh, encouraging and uh, enlightening. So, I mean, as Bird Clubs all over the, the, the country, all over the world, uh, what are we doing to motivate the citizen scientists that are part of the uh, you know, the, the, the bread clubs, when they come, do we leave a lasting impression, you know, about them? Um, yeah, Nanchin said, you know, I've been very, very active in bed watching. I love bed watching. I enjoy it. I've, uh, I've, I've been preaching about it and inviting people to re really um, imbibe that hobby. Uh, but, I mean, in, in 2019, that was, I mean, I, I think that was the time I started bird watching. I, I, we just went to our um, forest and after the bird watching, Nancy said, oh, is anyone interested in joining the bird club? Let me have your number. And she added me to the group and uh, behold, today I'm talking about <laughs> bird watching. So at every opportunity we, uh, we, we have to talk to people about 
um, uh, our hobby about this conservation. I mean, we have only one world and we have to uh, protect it. We have to uh, pre preserve it. So let's do a lot because we don't really know where these people are going to be. We don't know where, this, where these people are going to find themselves. Well, tomorrow, somebody would be in very, very high position, you know, and uh, if you can make very important policy changes that will protect our wildlife, that will make our job a lot more easier for us. So we must make sure that amateur ornithologists are encouraged. They are, uh, when they come, go out for bird watching, they're not intimidated. They don't feel, um, uh, they don't feel left out, you know. Um, one moment you say, oh, the, the bird just flew. Another moment, and so, yeah, they're really sort of uh, overwhelmed by, by the experience. Let's make sure that at every opportunity that we have a new bird, somebody visiting your bird club, and make sure that he does not leave that place the same. You know, you you give him an, a, a, an experience of a lifetime uh, so that he, he, he do, if he doesn't come bird watching the next time, he knows he has missed out on something uh, important. OK. Yeah, so funding of research. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Bird clubs funding research. And that will be an important legacy to leave if tomorrow we can say that just bird club is giving a PhD student, uh, is, is sponsoring a PhD student to, um, to, 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 to understudy where, where do I, I mean, I had this research question that I've been asking. Uh, do, do people who watch birds have more accident in their cars than people who don't watch birds? Because uh, as a bird watcher, once you're driving, your eyes are on the pole, your eyes are on the road, your eyes are in bushes, you know? Uh, so I'm wondering, is it a distraction from the people who participate in bird watching? Do they have more accidents than, I mean, questions like, uh, 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 like, like that. You know, and there's so much that we don't know about the bird species that we're seeing um, around us here in Jaws and all over the country. Can Birds Club, you know, um, um, grow big enough to be able to fund research in the things that um, uh, are of interest to us? I think that that's an area that we should look at and see how we're going to generate. And we have a lot of opportunities to generate the revenue basically on the uh, bedding night uh, bedding africa page you know when they um, um, they have year this uh, weekly sort of um um uh, teams so they say sometimes they say oh we're going to see only birds of south africa this time so once they did the birds of nigeria and quite a number of people were saying if we can guarantee that if they come to just <laughs> they will be able to see the um uh, plateau indigo bird they were going to come to nigeria to come birding you know, so I mean that's an opportunity, isn't it? That um, as a bird club, we should be able to know where our birds are all the time. The plateau in Dibo bird. I mean, sometimes I don't see the bird at all. Sometimes I just see. I don't really know where. It's just by chance. But you know, as a bird club, we should know where you can find these birds. We should be able to have sufficient data about their behavior, um, so that we can make money as a club. You know. We can invite, even in Nigeria, there's a friend from Abuja that has been saying he wants to come to Jaws just to come and bread watch, you know. And then there are people from Kano and, you know, you can guarantee that, um, yeah, when you come, we'll take you to such a, such a place and for, for a little fee, you know. <laughs> and uh, who knows, we'll be able to generate revenue to fund um, some students, uh, undergraduate students to, to do some, you know, some little research of things that are of interest um, uh, to them. But I think that that will be a legacy that bird clubs can leave, especially our bird clubs in Nigeria. We don't have to always, all the time, depend on um, uh, foreigners. This is very dear to me, you know, habitat restoration. There's so much that is happening now, and you really can't even complain when you see somebody cutting down a tree for fuel, you know. Um, uh, you know, going down to Mangu, there's this very thick forest around those rock formations, around Barakin Ladi. In November, we were passing there. We stopped by a little bird watching by the road. And um, sometime in January, we were going to pass there. We could not believe the degree of degradation of, uh, I mean, the destruction that has taken place there. People are busy cutting down the shrubs for firewood, you know? Um, of course, there's a problem in the land. Uh, there's a problem in the land, but I mean, these problems are not going to be there forever, you know. Um, uh, 
uh, we have to have a voice in terms of there are certain places that should be protected basically and they can only be protected if we have a voice to say oh this should not happen that should not happen of course nobody's going to come into our room to cut down those trees to for, for firewood because it's protected but i mean it's not only our room uh, you know there's, there are a lot more places around that as a bread club um, as we grow as a bread club we can buy up certain areas protect those um, um, uh, uh, habitats these things are possible basically they're really really possible it's just planning you just need planning basically so i'm challenging us what can we do what can we do community outreach is yes i i wouldn't emphasize much on this because i know that we are participating already in community outreaches but we need to do more we really need to do more because that's going to help us to leave legacies by the time we educate more people people are uh, very very conscious my children because i watch i do a lot of bird watching they they know uh before my son alan if a bird comes into the house he's going to run and chase the bird you know and the bird will fly away if myself as a kid um i i would carry my catapult and go around and if i see a bird i would stone the bird not that i want to eat it i'll just carry it see it appreciate and throw it away but i was doing that because i didn't have knowledge about anything as a child until i grew up and became as big as i am before i got to know about this but you see our children are learning differently okay so if we go into the community and um, and talk about these things, you know, I think that each of the birds clubs in Nigeria should have pamphlets, you should have educational materials, so that when you go uh, into a community, it's not just to go and a bird watch, and uh, you, you also educate the people about what, what you're doing. You, you really don't know who you'll be converting uh, uh, and, and creating a legacy in the future of, of something enormous and great. Yeah, so preserving bird habitats and promoting sustainable practice also very important um, uh, uh, activity that bird clubs uh, uh, carry out. I'll soon uh, <laughs> wrap up. I know I talk too much and the presentation is getting longer. Advocacy for sustainable practices, you know, so we are advocates. Um, one evening, uh, Joe, Joe Izang, who uh, went to um, uh, the forest, where is it? this Shandam, Pandam Wildlife Reserve, and sent me some pictures of heavy logging going on uh, at the you know at the park and before evening the next day they had summoned the park um, uh, rangers i mean the, the boss in the park i don't remember his name to come to joss you know because we did a lot of advocacy i called everybody that i knew in government uh, uh, during that long time all of them i told them this is what is happening this is what is happening we complain call iz call everybody and apparently they had a WhatsApp group, you know, they added me to the WhatsApp group. They had been advocating for, um, you know, that they should stop cutting down trees inside just metropolis indiscriminately. So when I brought up this issue, they added me to the group to say, oh, this is what we're, we're doing. But, you know, so that's a small scale kind of thing. But as a group, if we exert our authority, if we have jingles on FM, you know, um, you know, we 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 go and to uh, to the radio station and talk about bird watching. Talk about our hobby. Talk about the fact that people are destroying places that we go to, to watch birds. You know, it's our hobby. We have to protect it. Basically, that's what I'm. I'm, I'm well, that's the point I'm trying to um, uh, to 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 say. And I think I've talked about this. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Sorry. Oh. So yeah, I talked about the fact that um, uh, bird watching is getting is becoming really, really popular. We have to popularize it, but also there, there, there are issues of birding responsibly, right? So as bird watchers, we have to bird responsibly. Uh, there are quite a number of times that we go birding and people come to challenge us and hey, what are you guys doing? Basically, I find that. Um, they're not used to seeing people with binoculars and very long range cameras. So um, on Friday last week, somebody said, oh, when he saw me, he thought I was carrying a gun <laughs> until he came close to, you know. So um, yeah, you should be careful not to trespass into people's land because you've seen a, a bird that you have never seen and you jump somebody's fence to enter his house to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to just see that bird. That's a crazy thing to do. So uh, bird watching also promotes collaboration, you know, global partnership, um, yeah, um, uh, and, and, and 
and it actually gives a lot of opportunity. Um, uh, being, uh, connecting with people all over the country. Ah, yeah, you very when you come to Lagos, let's go. You know, um, and I mean, I think that uh, yeah, remember the guy that came from Ethiopia. Yeah, we already have a uh, you know a plan to meet in Ethiopia and go bird watching. So it's great global partnership. I don't know where um, that's going to. Uh, end up in raising awareness and inspiring action. Bird clubs play a vital role in raising global awareness. And I think that we should do more in raising local and global awareness about the things that we do as a bird club. So we should not limit ourselves to just going out for bird watching. We should add a few more uh, things. I mean, I don't expect that we'll add everything at once, but yeah, we keep getting better by the day. Keep getting better, keep improving. Um, all right. Yeah. So I said earlier on that, um, yeah, if you had some ideas um, about what legacies can you leave, can we leave as a bird club, as your as Lagos bird club, as Abuja bird club, as Jigawa bird club, what legacy can you leave? You know, what can you do to leave a lasting legacy that 20 years down the line, 50 years down the line, 80 years down the line, people are going to look back and say, oh, these people did such and such and such. And that is why we're still able to see such and such happen, you know? So what will be our legacy as a bird club? That's the essence of this presentation, to challenge us, to motivate us, to do things that will leave a lasting legacy, as most bird clubs have done all over um, uh, the world. So I don't know if people have posted anything in the chat. Um, uh, Nanchin, you will have a look at that after we finish this presentation. But really, I have a dream, basically, that there's this very beautiful place whenever I drive uh, through Fan to go to Mangu. Um, most of you who have passed through that rock, you would see, you would have that place, you would have seen this beautiful Lopat rock. But behind the Lopat rock, there's a very beautiful landscape there with lots of rock formation a diversity of forests woodlands well forested areas and everything but honestly i believe that one day that place is going to be something like this it's going to be a bird a heaven for bird watchers to come and watch so i'm saving money i am planning i'm strategizing and uh, if you know anyone who is an investor an angel investor let him know let him come around and we'll go and buy that land and turn it into a brother's heaven and i believe that is possible in conclusion, no one ever lived in a birdless world. We have always throughout history shared this planet with birds. This is a quotation by Roger Troy. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope that we've learned a few things. And um, um, like I said, this is not pure science. It's very basic presentation. Uh, I, I would take uh, contributions, comments, questions, and additions. Thank you very much. Over, yeah. Yeah, I'm done. Lunching, were you? Uh, I hope people were listening to this. Can you hear me now? Hello? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Uh -huh. So thank you so much, Dr. Phantom, for this brilliant and wonderful presentation. I must say that um, everybody is challenged if I'm saying or if I'm speaking the mind of the people that joined the call, you know, because for you taking us through history to this time, I'm bringing us to the impact that a bird club can be able to, to do or to impact the immediate um, environment or our, yes, our immediate community. That is so, so huge and very challenging. And of course, looking at all of these things that you've highlighted, <laughs> we have we have not started anything yet. But then, believe me, so many people also have that kind of huge dream that you have. Yeah. But then, um, before we go any further, um, for our audience, please, if you have any questions, you can, by the way of raise of hand, ask the presenter directly or you can drop your questions in the chat, then I read it out. But then I can go check in the chat because uh, Dr. Panton has asked us on what we can be able to do. And then uh, Haruna, Harun is saying that advocacy for bird protection and their habitats. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I believe the presenter also mentioned that, right? That we can do more than just 
bird watching. We can also advocate for the protection of this of their habitat because once we're doing that, we're actually doing it for ourselves. But then there's a, another comment from Twinji Matthew. He said, as a member of ABC, that's Abuja Bird Club, I think we can produce a checklist of birds in Abuja so that um, people visiting the city for bird watch can use it as a guide apart from the Western the birds of Western African guide. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think yeah, that I is- I like that idea too. Hello, okay, Dr. Panton, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was saying that I, I love this idea that Tunji put forward here, that actually you can have a checklist of, I mean, common birds, because if if I, if I uh, Tunji tells me that, look, if you come to Abuja, I guarantee that uh, you're going to see uh, um, a rose turaco or something like that, that we have, uh, we've cited a couple of, you know, based on the list that they have, the common sightings, let's say the top 100 birds that you can see in Abuja in one week, you know, it would be very really exciting for uh, uh, for people. And really, there are people that are really interested. It's just because we're not marketing the uh, the hobby. We're not uh, going all out to, you know, talk about these things. Yeah. So, yeah, very lovely comment. Same with uh, Harun's comment. Yeah. I agree with him. I advocacy for bird protection and their habitat as well, you know. Um, yeah. Unless you start bird watching, you won't really appreciate this. Then you you go out and you don't see any any bird and you're feeling really, really bad. That you're, you know, so <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay. So thank you for the addition there. So basically, I think maybe the, the talk has really like hit people in the head that everybody needs to go back to the table and start thinking of doing more. Since I cannot see any more uh, thoughts being shared in the in the chat. Okay, but uh, Natalia, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, um, everyone. And um, it's been a while I attended the webinar, and this is like a very good welcome back. And um, I really enjoyed every part of it. And I, I have um, a question, and I think maybe I could coin it into a suggestion too. Now, before I started watching birds actively in, um, I think, 2020, maybe 2020, yes. In 2019, I think, maybe 1819, I'm aware that NIBAB um, organized, I don't know if it is a training now, and I knew there were two field sites in Nigeria, one at Yankari and um, one at Weber Farms in Edo State. And I think that that thing actually forms like a synergy. So maybe people from the bed club are to meet with um, other members of bed club from every other part of Nigeria. There was this mixing collaboration and I'm aware that so people made network at that point that they have maintained friendship. They have maintained up to now. So um, this is like an appeal. Yeah. To, to Naibab, that can we have something like that frequently more? Like maybe like um, a bed club convention, a Nigerian bed club convention that brings all of us together, and maybe we could choose different sites, different years, just to foster collaboration and interrelationship between the bed clubs in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I like I like I love 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 that. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. That 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 is really a huge suggestion. It will be, it's already noted and it will be placed on the table of the NIBAP management. I hope they look into it and we have something like that. And really, as you have said, rightly said that the, the other field course at Yankari and Wepa Farm actually did a lot for the people that actually attended and were able to receive the training. So hopefully, I'm very sure NIBAP will look into this and will be able to do something for the growing population of citizen scientists and bed watchers in Nigeria. Um, Tinju Matthew, you can go ahead. Thank you very um, much. Uh, I think um, I will go with uh, what uh, Natani has just said now. Yeah, this the convergence of- uh, Sorry, Tunji, you are a bit low. If you can increase your volume yeah, a bit yeah, so yeah. that we hear you. Are you hearing me now? Yeah, loud yes. enough. Yeah, I said I will go with what uh, Nathaniel said concerning bed clubs coming together 
uh, to rob mines uh, is going to be a very good one. And I also want to add to uh, some of the presentation concerning the advocacy of uh, how we can better protect uh, bird habitat. I think um, when I traveled down to, uh, that was last year, I, where I used to go for bed watch or bed monitoring, I, I saw a lot of uh, people there farming. So I had to talk to them about them cutting down trees. That is not the best thing to do. So I had to talk to them and the reason between me, with I had to tell them the benefits of not cutting down those trees and the benefits that they get from those trees. And they were like, ah, that they didn't know that such a thing can bring about all those benefits. And you know, this, this issue of advocacy is very, very important. And even say in this Abuja, that I, because I, I work in Abuja, wow. a lot of a lot of trees are being cut down in Abuja on a daily basis. And it seems that nobody is even saying anything about that. In, in, in the area that I used to do bed monitoring in Abuja, I discovered that um, a lot of things are happening, especially I discovered that the environment is becoming, is changing on a monthly basis. You, become, you begin to see dry places everywhere. But those birds still keep coming because there are still some trees around that place. So I think, as you said, we need to do more advocacy, especially for bed clubs. We need to do more on this. And um, I think in Abuja Bed Club, um, as you said, most of us have not been doing all those things. We just go there to go and check beds. Then uh, we see new, new things, but we are still need to go. Maybe one day we just use it for advocacy, not for bed watching now. Let's just go and educate these people on how to protect this forest, protect their environment. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank thanks you. a lot for that contribution. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Panton. Look, I was saying thank you very much for the contribution. It's quite, uh, yeah, apt. All right, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Matthew. Yes, indeed, we need to do more advocacy because as the speaker will say during his talk, said that advocacy leads to protection. It's only when people know that they will know what is right and what is wrong. And beyond just what bed watching in our various bed clubs, let's take up this challenge and put in advocacy in our programs. I think it will go a very long way. And also trying to document and share all our observation instead of just keeping it to ourselves. It will actually do a lot of good for us all by also inviting others that are outside, not giving a damn about nature. I think it's left for us to make sure that they give a damn about bird watching and nature conservation. So thank you so much, everyone. I don't know, do we still have more contributions or questions to ask the presenter? Okay, so if there are no more contribution or questions, I will want to especially thank you, Dr. Pantong, for making our time to give us this interesting talk and to thank each and everyone for joining today's call. We look forward to having you next month, which promised to be another exciting time with nature. Believe me, next month is going to be about bringing in the young into conservation. We wouldn't want to miss out on that. So please do make out time with the NIBA monthly webinar. So on this note, please, um, I want to ask for just one thing, if you can all put up your cameras and then I will give a shot to the entire people that joined the call, very important for documentation as, as, as it's been noted in today's talk. So please kindly put up your camera and then I will give a quick one, then we can all do have a good evening. Um, probably Dr. Panton, you can yeah, stop sharing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Tunji. I need to have your face. 
Bring Jima to you. Okay, I think I will just go Hello. ahead and snap. Hi, thank thank you. you so much, Madam Shade. Miss Joy, happy. Please, if you can kindly put up your cameras, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining today. I so look forward to meeting all of you during the next call, and I hope you will invite a friend next time. So on this note, I want to say do have a good evening and bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Panton. Yeah, thank you.